Hi, my name is Hannah, and today we will interview Mark. Originally from Spain and now based in London, Mark is the COO of European Technology Company. Today he gives us his view on key trends as we emerge into a post-pandemic world. This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ Contact. Mark, good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thanks for sharing some of your time. I know you're a super busy guy. So for those who may be watching us on YouTube or for those who are listening to us on one of the podcast platforms, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, my name is Mark. Um, I'm originally from Barcelona, from Spain, but I have been living abroad for most of the past eight to 10 years. Um, so I've been moving around between yeah, London, Germany. Um, I'm basically now kind of trying to see if I want to stay in Lisbon for a bit. Um, So yeah, moving around a lot. Um, For the past seven years, I have been working at an affiliate marketing company uh, called Global Savings Group, um, where I am now the CEO. Um, And yeah, it's one company that started as part of the Rocket Internet Group, um, but later grew onto a much bigger thing. And now, yeah, essentially it's quite a big company with 500, 600 people now around the world. Okay, wow. And you worked for the field as well. You spent some time in Brazil, right? I did. Yes, exactly. So um, I worked with them um, in different countries as well. So I spent some time in Germany, um, two and a half years in Germany, and then moved to Brazil uh, for a year also to, to kind of work on their operations there. And yeah, then I did the same in Amsterdam in the UK and now kind of being responsible for all of Europe so I can be more or less where I want. Okay, that's great. So uh, this is the kind of conversation, as you know, that I like to have people who have that international perspective. And I think what makes this one even more appealing is your experience in the technology space, which, of course, Mm -hmm. is what, you know, everyone's focused on that right now. So given what we're going through right now, I know it's uh, unprecedented, lots of cliches. What do you see are key trends that we need to pay attention to? I think, especially working in technology, right? Like uh, with technology being such a um, flexible space and such a space that is already like very, very uh, location independent. We've seen that um, in our company and in many other tech companies around the world, um, location and offices are becoming a lot less relevant uh, to employers. So we see that a lot of companies are just like completely scratching their plans for um, having like one big headquarters and having everyone move to a city and just like moving to a more distributed setup. Um, we already had a bit of a distributed setup across 10 offices. Now it's becoming even more global and we let people work from wherever they feel like they should be working. So yeah, I think that's going to be a big, big, big trend um, in that direction. Okay. Now that, that one is particularly controversial. I was on a, another Zoom call with a bunch of people, I think it was two Fridays ago, and it became quite a debate. Some people are saying in their, I guess in their offices or their experience, it's been a huge gain in productivity, efficiency yeah. gain. People don't need to commute anymore. They're not tired mm-hmm. and frustrated and they get a lot more work done. But then there's some people on the other camp that say no. <laughs> Kids are running around, you know, there's so many distractions. You keep walking to the refrigerator. So what 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 are your thoughts? Where do you sit in that debate? Um, It's it's quite funny to hear this because we are, we're facing similar challenges. I think, um, I I think it's, it's not a black or white topic. I think there's people that really, really do benefit a lot from working remotely. Um, There's people that um, basically had like massive boosts in productivity. Um, just as an example, like uh, we have a few people in our London office that used to take at least one hour, two hours even um, to commute to work every day. That's, that's an additional like uh, two or three hours that they get per day that they can uh, basically uh, spend doing whatever they like. So that's a huge improvement in their life quality. Um, 
we've also seen lots of efficiency gains. Um, I think um, being able to just basically log on and talk to everyone in any of the other offices makes it also a bit easier to communicate. Um, before, people tended to talk more to the people next to them. Now it's becoming a lot more global. So for me, it's as easy to talk to someone in London as it is to talk to someone in Germany. Um, so that makes communication easier. Mm -hmm. um, it is true though that um, for people that maybe don't have the best working setup at home or that they have to take care of children or have other responsibilities at home, um, it has become increasingly difficult, right? But I think that's more of a result of the pandemic um, um, rather than the remote working situation, right? Like if you can work remotely and your children are at the daycare or nursery, um, I, I believe that a lot of those issues are um, sort of sorted. Okay, and as a leader, like, what additional skills did you have to bring to the table to in order to manage the i don't know how the the, the new challenges that arise from managing a remote team so we, we've worked on we've worked on on this topic quite a bit um so it's something that we had already started doing uh, prior to the uh, forced remote working that we have to do mm -hmm. now um purely because of the uh, differences between offices and the distance between the teams right like you always need to set up like some sort of communication protocols procedures etc um but things that we have been doubling down on and that we have worked a lot on um, have been like uh, structure and processes so obviously when you don't have everyone in the same room or you don't have everyone in the same office, um, things need to be absolutely clear from the beginning, right? Like uh, you don't want people to have to ask every time that they need to do a task. Um, so you focus a lot on building out processes that are scalable, repeatable, and that you can essentially just roll out and not have to worry about them anymore. So that's one big area. The other topic is communication. So um, especially when it comes to informal communication right like we've seen that a lot of the communication that happened within an office was really important so for example like we have like a lots of sales teams that um essentially rely on talking to each other a lot to, to kind of say hey, hey what do we do with this customer what's mm -hmm. how do we solve this issue we've seen that that is hard to replicate um when you are not sitting next to each other um but we have um set up like uh, different communication channels for that so we use slack um much more now than we used to before we have daily stand-ups with the core teams so that they can also um have like some sort of informal chats that that can kind of compensate for this lack of visual or like face-to-face -face interaction and do you see like really i mean i guess there always have been cultural differences but it's been like exaggerated at this point because i was reading for example that i think twice the number of people have returned to work in paris than in london so yeah. that uh, in the continent there may be a still uh we need to be in the office sort of mentality whereas in yeah. london or new york it's now we're going to stay remote i think I th we, we've seen some of this like we we do have like a few countries that um where people are very very keen to go back to the office i think it has to do with the feeling of belonging to a team and and kind of wanting to be present there right so there's a very very much a social aspect to it um i think and and it's funny that you mentioned that because we have seen that in our french office as well so yeah. we we have seen that a lot of people in that office um have decided to return to work even though there's no requirement for them to do so um and we have um yeah funnily enough also seen the same in spain where people okay. really really wanted to get back um work with the team um and yeah like within the limits that we have obviously like uh due to um center restrictions um we do see like some differences from countries to countries and then some countries where we have absolutely no one like in our london office there's no one working from from the office and no one that really wants to go anytime soon so it's quite interesting to see the differences as well so again okay so going forward now i've seen again people have very varying perspectives do you think that this remote work is here to stay or eventually we would return to a situation that's closer to the previous status quo i think i think there is no possible scenario in which we go back to where we were before i think okay. It has been proven now for most companies, especially companies that do not necessarily have any on-site work to be done, that mm -hmm. the benefits for employees and the benefits to productivity 
are far too great to just ignore them now and just say, hey, let's go back to full office hours uh, five days a week. So I, I believe that the, that the future probably looks more like a hybrid version where um, people spend some time in the office, some time at home, and there's like a nice mix of these things um, happening. Um, what that will look like exactly, we still have to figure it out at our company at least. Um, but that's what we're trying to understand, like really, like what can we do to make sure that we get the benefits from being in the office, but at the same time that we don't lose this productivity and this like uh, extra type quality that, that you get from working from home. Okay. And what about, okay, so moving away from the micro and, and taking like a yeah. macro perspective on what's going on. What about like Europe? Even before this, this pandemic, Europe was going through some challenges. Uh, the biggest and most obvious would be Brexit, but there are some also other challenges as well. As a European company, how do you see things turning out? Uh, what, what is your guess as to what the outcome may be? Cool. Like lots of, lots of moving pieces there in Europe, right? Yeah. I think um, I, I'm honestly a bit torn on this one because I think it can go either way. So um, on one hand, you see very uh, individualistic movements in Europe, like Brexit, but also like in other countries, like in Germany or the Netherlands, where people really don't believe in like a joint um, union um, and they believe that they would do better on their own. But at the same time, I also see a future in which that just simply cannot happen. Just like uh, if you just look at Brexit and all the implications that that has for many people, many companies, all the changes that that will require already like happening now at the end of the year, mm -hmm. you see how that's not very practical for any single country to kind of make the same moves. So, so I only believe in a Europe that is kind of um, working together at least in some sort of way. Um, we'll need to see like if we manage to keep it together or if, if people like kind of become more skeptical and more individualistic from that perspective. But it's a tough one, I think. It is, it is. And you know, I guess most companies have uh, contingency plans. And do you see yourself and you know, other members of your team having contingency plans as well? Just in case, for example, you know, it's a hard Brexit. What about your, if you have a European passport, what about a British residency and vice versa and stuff like that? So we, we do, we've, we, we've been looking at that for a bit. Um, the good thing for our business is that all of our local offices mostly work with the local um, okay. countries, with the local markets. So everything that we do in the UK is very UK focused. Um, so from that perspective, we're not too worried from a business perspective because it's just very self-contained. Mm -hmm. um, we do employ a large number of <clears throat> European people though um, in our UK office. So um, there obviously like we've made sure that everyone kind of works towards having a settled status that allows them to stay for a few more years at least. And um, we are very prepared to also offer them uh, visa sponsorship. So we, we have accounted for those extra costs and extra paperwork that we would need to do. Um, but our plan is not to change the setup, it's to continue with what we do. Um, we're lucky enough that we employ um, like qualified people in general, so it is quite easy for us to sponsor their visas. Um, so that's what our, what we're planning to do, uh, just to make sure that people do not see their life completely disrupted from it. Okay, gotcha. And again, even taking an even wider perspective now, I mean, if you're anybody's paying attention to anything to do with technology, they are aware of what's going on with TikTok. Yeah. Uh, what's going on between the US and People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. Do you see, I mean, there's always, I mean, even before the pandemic, one could argue that there was a, a more nationalistic push. And there was a little yeah. bit of a push back to the whole globalization thing, which is what produced President Trump's uh, election in first place. Brexit, yeah. you know, Australia, Philippines, and it's been happening all over in Brazil yeah. as well, Mexico. Yeah. So, that's been happening for a while and now it's manifesting itself in different ways for example mm -hmm. with uh, technology companies yeah. do you see it e even that escalating like other countries wanting to protect their champions in the technology space or do you think this is a one-off it's it's the us it's china they will do what they do but for the rest of us we'll keep pushing ahead what are your thoughts no, I, I definitely think that's gonna. That's only gonna get bigger. I think um, if you look at the major economic drivers um, throughout the 
last centuries. Um, there's always very, been very clear industries that have pushed through and that have made um, GDP um, like grow exponentially for some of these countries. Um, at this point, it's definitely technology. If you look at like the like stock markets, like like technology companies are driving like a huge percentage of of the of the value that is now um, laying in these countries. So I think that many many countries will go for like a very protective approach there, and it's exactly what's happening now with TikTok and with Facebook as well with Google, where. Um, Every country wants to make sure that they control the technology, that they control the data, especially the data and the information um, that these companies hold. Um, so I, I think I, I think it will only get bigger. At the moment, I think the US and China are the ones that are kind of competing for this because they, they do have the biggest uh, tech companies that hold the most data and they have like pretty differentiated markets that kind of can overlap at some point. But like, they don't really have any competition outside of that. So I, I, I guess it could happen in Europe as well, for example, but uh, I do not see with what company that would be uh, an option as well, just simply because we don't have companies at that scale yet. <laughs> and that leads me to my next question. Why doesn't Europe have any company of that scale yet? That's, I think it's, it's quite interesting. I think, I think there's been lots of good companies like um, coming out of Europe, um, but I think there's a bit of, of a difference in mentality. I think, um, especially when it comes to the US, um, you can see that entrepreneurs in the US have a much more um, ambitious mentality from that perspective. So everything that they build is built to take over the world, so to say, and, and they build everything um, with that in perspective and they, they really, really have the ecosystem for that, right? So if you, if you go to Silicon Valley or anywhere in the Bay Area in San Francisco, you see that all companies are kind of competing. They are all like uh, getting funding, they, which generates even more competition. So everyone's going to the next level and everyone's trying to grow as much as possible. So that's, that's something that I think is lacking at the moment in Europe, like this competitiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think from the um, Chinese side, I think it's a bit different there. I think there it's simply like the access to a very, very, very specific market. So I think lots of uh, Chinese companies have basically uh, grown a lot due to the catering that they do to, to their specific uh, population, right? So many of the unicorns there or many of the apps there are very um, specific to the Chinese market and, and many of them, um, and, and actually most of them, except maybe TikTok, haven't managed to really become super big outside of China. So there I think it's more like, like how the market is completely different from the rest of the world and, and how they manage to just like grow so much bigger um, because the market is so big already by itself. So yeah, different, different perspectives, but I think hard for Europe to replicate either of those sites, just like for different reasons. But is it, I mean, okay, so you said like in the US, it's uh, the average entrepreneur tends to be more competitive and you know china has a very specific market so i think it's almost impossible for a technology firm to to make it there and then of course there's the whole rumor at least it's the it's the argument put forward by by the white house that the chinese the china companies not the chinese the china companies are actually backed by the ccp by the government itself yeah. so they're able to scale they're able to do what they do because of government support now Coming back to coming back to, to Europe, I mean, is it are we saying therefore that European entrepreneurs aren't as competitive, or that Europe European governments aren't as supportive of potential unicorns? Is that what we're saying? So I, I think it's it's not a lack of competitiveness. I think there's very talented people in Europe and people that do have the ambition, but I think the ecosystem itself doesn't lend itself to, to growing as much. So um, whereas in the US or in China, you have a single market with yeah. millions, hundreds of millions of people, um, shared funding, um, no nationalistic views, because like it's so big. Um, in Europe, all of that is split among a few countries, right? So you will have like some tech startups in, in Spain, you'll have some starting in France, some in the UK, some in Germany, um, and every market or every country will focus a lot on helping their own. Um, which is in turn kind of preventing this joint cooperation and helping the ecosystem 
the European ecosystem kind of like grow by itself. I think it's fine, but um, the differences in regulations between countries, the differences in uh, funding options, um, just make it a bit slower and a bit harder for European companies to kind of get access to the same um, tools. And the lack of government support that you were mentioning, I don't think it's a lack of government support, it's more in the US, it's a very clear laissez-faire um, approach, um, just do what you want, capitalism, just like make it grow, you get money, it works. In China, it's probably more like the government even wants to foster these kind of companies. They want them to grow and to kind of uh, become more powerful. And that comes with some trade-offs, obviously, in privacy and in what these companies can do. But it seems to also work well for scale. In Europe, you have like this mix where maybe one country is very um, keen to do this kind of businesses. Um, another country might not be so keen. There's a lot of privacy regulation. So it's, it's just a lot harder to manage, in my opinion. It's a lot harder to manage, yet the same American companies come over here and make it work, right? Google is here, Facebook yeah. is here, whatever. So how is it that they can scale in Europe and yeah. European tech firms struggle? That's, that's a very interesting point. I think, yeah. I think it's more because I don't think the problem is with scaling and executing. So that's something that, um, that we've seen very clearly, right? For us, it's also quite easy to go to a market, replicate, build out the operations. And that's what a lot of tech companies are doing. Mm -hmm. However, building the basis for these companies, um, I think there's simply no, not enough scale and not enough support or in the ecosystem for them to do that in the first place, right? So I believe that um, if a company wants to focus on Europe, like they might be better off starting outside of Europe, um, growing in the US, becoming really big from there and then like expanding to Europe. That might be an even faster way than starting in Europe and then trying to go to the US, um, just purely from this perspective. Especially when it comes to innovative products, right? I'm, I'm not talking about any kind of tech startup, but anything that, that kind of is kind of like a big breakthrough or of some sort. Hmm. But, and then having said that, you guys are doing it. You guys are building out a European centric tech company. Yeah. So yeah. did you have did you have to follow that playbook that you just mentioned? Did you have to go outside, get scale, and come back? No, we we did it in a in a bit of a of a different way. Um, but but we were lucky as well that we had um, massive funds like uh, to start uh, with, right? Like uh, like that's that's something that a lot of companies don't have access to. Um, and we started in Germany, which is probably together with the UK the easiest market to do this within Europe, right? Um, so what we did was essentially, um, but wh what we did was also not build Germany first, for example. So we started right away with um, countries outside of Europe. So we started launching Brazil, India, and then Poland. Um, so we also kind of started like with different markets, and then like at some point like went back to Europe and kind of grew that from from scratch. So a, a bit of a different approach, but but also with some similarities. Okay. So a bit of a different approach, also similar. So what advice you would give if someone is an entrepreneur, they have an idea or they're in a startup and they're still at the seed funding, you know, this still early stage, yeah. but they have ambition. They have European scale size ambition. Yeah. What advice would you give them? I think something that we've learned um, in these seven years of operations, right? Or eight years now, um, it's really, really try to get it right somewhere really doesn't really matter where you are um, um i think it's important that you at least um manage to get product market fit and some traction in at least one market it doesn't really matter what market that is but then uh, you need to be comfortable enough with the execution of things um, that you can then roll it out to other markets right um if you go ahead and try to expand internationally very quickly, you will see that um, you will just struggle getting traction. You will not have the funding to kind of grow all the markets at the same time. Um, so I, I would really advise that, that, that companies try to get it right one time, then maybe right a second time. And then when they're ready, then to continue raising funds to go for like a proper global expansion um, at that point and then like do it very selectively as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, proof of concept first, show that it's, it works and then you can, you can move from there. Now, uh, in terms of funding, do you see what's happening now as having the ability to change the funding landscape? Because up until, let's say, 2019, well, let's say pre-WeWork, you know, yeah. oh, you have a great idea, here's a million bucks, right? But some people say that's not necessarily the case right now. What are your views? 
<laughs> funding is always tricky, right? Because I think yeah. funding depends on two big areas. So one is the inner end value of the idea. I think there's a lot of funding that happens just uh, based on vision, right? And what that thing can become. And you see it in many, many tech companies, right? You see, in, you see it in Uber, you see it in all of the delivery companies, uh, you see it in literally everything that is kind of loss making at the moment and will probably yeah. continue being loss making for the next 10, 20 years. You sure. see that that's like a very vision driven funding approach, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's for me one kind of funding. Then there's the other kind of funding, which is like really much more rational, much more investment focused. And it's like, hey, I'm gonna invest here because in two, three, four, five years, I'm gonna get a return. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a much more outcome focused funding. Um, I think when it comes to the first one, like companies that, that operate in these spaces, they have an advantage because um, it's a very competitive space. So a lot of people want to be in the next big thing. And a lot of people believe that there will always be additional funding um, because it has been the case for the past few years, right? So everyone wants to go in, and, in Uber and Tesla and everything because they know that they will be able to continue raising and continue making the pie bigger. Yeah. Um, for companies that focus on profitability, that focus on on kind of like an outcome, um, yeah, like outcome based um, kind of way of running it, um, it becomes a bit harder because then there's a lot of funds that that are simply not available because people prefer to invest into these bigger things, so to say, right? So it's it's a bit like of this um, dichotomy between these two kinds of companies, in my opinion, at the moment. Okay, so you know what? I mean, obviously you're closer to this than than I am. I'm just on the outside reading stuff and looking in. But I would have imagined that given what's happening right now, people are a bit more risk averse. I would imagine that they would be more yeah. risk averse. And therefore that second group, those yeah. that are you know, already showing signs of profitability and have at least a, a roadmap to being profitable will be a bit more attractive than the negative net margin businesses. But you're saying it's in fact the opposite. Yeah, I mean, that, that would make sense. So it would make sense in like a period of uncertainty for that yeah. to be the where you invest money into a company and then you have like a clear way out after a few years and you're going to make a profit. That's, that's essentially like what would make rational sense. Um, what we do see though is that um, yeah. at the moment there's very, very, very few alternatives to um, investing. So, yeah. so um, anyone who has money, essentially can put it on the stock market. They can invest privately into big companies or any company for that matter, or they can just put it in bonds, which are obviously like at 0% interest yeah. rates, right? So that means that there's still a lot of money in the market um, mm. and a lot of confidence that the market will continue growing. Therefore, um, people believe that if they throw, I don't know how many million at one of these companies, even though they're not generating profits now, the value will continue to increase over time and it will increase enough for them to still make a profit from that, right? So that's that's a bit like how, how things are working or how I see a lot of people also seeing it. Okay. So then I'm going back to the point that you raised earlier where you were asked, okay, so give advice to that young entrepreneur who has a startup and you were saying, well, you know, get it right in one market and then scale, right? But then perhaps it's, you can think of it differently. Maybe, you know, get that audacious big, idea that may, that you think may change the world and you can still pitch it to investors who have a lot of dry powder looking for opportunities like this and there still is a chance that someone will throw a million bucks at you right yeah so for sure the problem yeah. with that is you need to come up with that idea right in, right in reality if you look at it from in the past 10 years there's yeah. there's probably i don't know like 30, 40, 50 companies that, that kind of reach the level where you say, hey, people are happy to invest money into this, even though they know that they're not going to return a profit anytime soon and there's no plan to do so. Mm -hmm. um, for most entrepreneurs and for most companies, like the reality is that they actually need to deliver results to their investors. Yeah. Um, yeah. And these investors basically are still looking for, um, I don't know, like five, 10 times their initial investment, right? So they, there's still this component of, value growing and exponential value growing that needs to happen, right? So, so when I say start slow and get a proof of concept and then expand, that doesn't mean um, stay small. It, yeah. it means rather make sure you get it right so that you don't 
um, yeah, basically waste your time and then at some point just cannot get any more funding, but make sure that you get like these bases in place so that investors can say, yes, actually, not only is this going to be profitable, but we believe in this becoming like 10 times what it is now, 20 times what it is. And then hopefully um, get enough people to believe in it that you will get also um, an exit in some sort of way. Okay. Uh, last question. Emerging markets, because your experience, you have dabbled in some emerging markets as well. Yeah. What is what do you think is the outlook? Do you think people are still bullish and they're still looking for opportunities, or they've been a sort of pull back while we figure things out? What are your thoughts? I th I think it's it's a bit of a mix. I think okay. um, the problem that we see now um, in in many emerging markets is that. Um, everyone sees the potential. So obviously, like it's usually a very large population um, that are probably um, a few um, levels behind um, in terms of consumption, in terms of like where they are, in terms of like the, the growth of, of, of some of the industries. Um, mm -hmm. So the opportunity is for sure there. Mm -hmm. However, what we see is that execution in many of these markets is much more difficult than you would think initially, right? So um, we see it, for example, with our operations in India and our operations in Brazil. Um, the potential is there. It is um, massive if you manage to make it work. However, making it work is exponentially more difficult as well, right? Like it's something that a lot of foreign companies also think, oh, cool, we're going to replicate this. We're going to do that. It works here. Why wouldn't it work in Brazil? Um, very, very different markets, very different approaches. Um, so you do need a lot of local knowledge as well. So, so, so I'm, I'm still quite bullish on, on, on emerging markets. And, and I think it's like a great area of expansion because they will for sure continue growing. Um, but it's not as easy as you might think. And at the same time, um, governments, regulatory topics become increasingly difficult in those countries. Um, so it's, it's always like extra things to consider if you want to launch there. Okay, wonderful. Mark, thank you. For, thank you for sharing your insights. What I like about this conversation is that it's different from the ones that I've been having within recent times because the others have been a bit, let's say, leaning towards the, the pessimistic side. You know, yeah. people are a bit nervous about what's happening now, the level of uncertainty, but you seem to have embraced the uncertainty and you, you're seeing everything in such a positive way. Mark, thank you for your time. Yeah, of course. Anytime. I think we have to stay positive. <laughs> <laughs> Please subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.txt. Email us at help at htj.txt to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.